Are you looking for a way to dig into your world building for your story? Then I recommend that you check out my world building workbook for fiction writers. Now available. It's at howtowritethefuture.com. Just head on over there, click sign up, put your name and email, and there you go. That workbook will be delivered to your inbox straight away. Hey everyone, welcome back to How to Write the Future podcast. The focus of this podcast and the focus of my work is to support writers to create positive, optimistic stories because when we vision what is possible, we help make it so. And part of that visioning is learning the tools of today that help us become better writers for tomorrow. Part of becoming a better writer is also learning how to become a better marketer of your fiction and of yourself as a novelist. So join me on this three-part series where I interview three historical fiction authors who have come together to create a collective to market their work. Let's dig in. All right. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much. I have some great guests today on How to Write the Future podcast, a podcast for writers who want to bring positive and optimistic stories out into the world and also want to find innovative ways to bring their books out into the world. And so I've been doing a series of conversations with interesting people doing interesting things with book marketing. And that is why I have these three wonderful women here today who are going to tell us about what they offer and how they came about. And I forgot to write down the name of your cooperative, Paper Lantern. Is that right? Paper, Paper Lantern, Lantern Writers. Paper Lantern Writers. Mm -hmm. Paper Lantern Writers, which when I met you all at the Bay Area Book Festival in downtown Berkeley like a year or two ago, I think it was last year. Mm -hmm. last year. Yeah, last year. I was really struck by how you're all different historical fiction writers. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And you came yeah. together to be a collective to market your books. And I thought, how wonderful is that? And how eclectic. So I would love to hear from each of you. I would love to know about how and why you got started. I'll call on each of you and you can introduce yourself also. Tell us a little bit about you and how and why for you, the Paper Lantern Collective got started. And Edie, since you're my point person and help me organize this, let's start with you. Welcome. Thank you. So I'm Edie Kay. I write historical romance. I am fascinated by writing. I've always wanted to be a writer. I actually have an MFA in creative writing. I went through all the things. I worked on literary magazines. And when I decided to go the historical romance route, part of the reason why I wanted to do it was because I wanted to be an indie self-publisher. I wanted to do my own. So I wanted to have control of my stories. I wanted control of my covers. I wanted control. So I also had done my research and knew that in romance genre, it was easier, especially five years ago, it was a lot easier for the romance genre to do self-publishing than other genres. I went that route. And when I finally got the first book ready to go, I went to a historical novel society chapter meeting, a Northern California chapter meeting. And I'd been a member of the historical novel society for many years and finally got around to showing up. And at that meeting was Anna and Linda, who were proposing this idea of a marketing collective. And I was let them tell the story because I showed up for the meeting and just raised my hand and said, I'm in. Whatever you're doing, I'm in. That sounds great. That sounds great. And can you tell us in a few sentences the historical romance that you write? I write award-winning Regency romances about women's boxing. So my romances are, of course, very uplifting because a romance has to be a love story as a main component of the storyline and also a happily ever after. So I take a lot of my historical interest interests and then drape them over a framework of a romance. So my books, some people say, especially The Box from the Blacksmith, reads a lot more like historical fiction. It just happens to be that there's a romance in there too. Whereas some of my other books, like my newest release of I Count's Vengeance, is very much a love story with some other historical facts thrown in there. Including a, your main character who's a boxer. Yes, yes there okay. is women boxing in some way or another in all four of my books. Fabulous. Love it. Thank you so much. Linda, I'm going to jump to you next. If you could tell okay. us a little bit about why you are one of the founding members 
of this collective and a little bit about what gave you the impetus to create this kind of group as opposed to, I don't know, just occasionally networking with people to <laughs> cross promote and that kind of thing. Okay. I'm Linda Eulisite. I have been traditionally published with a small publisher. I have self-published books. And recently, my most recent book and the books coming out in June have both been published by a hybrid publisher. So I've had a lot of experience with small different ways of publishing. I write heritage fiction, which is historical fiction based on my ancestors. Mostly stories that my grandmother told me when I was a little girl that now I'm thinking about going, it's really good stories. I need to get those stories out there. I find that my ancestors were very involved in suffragette movement movement in all kinds of things, meeting people. One of my ancestors in my book that's coming out had Zachary Taylor's daughter as her maid of honor at her wedding. So those stories and connections are very cool to me. And I'm trying to write and make them cool to other people. So I'd been self-publishing my books and I went to a historical novel society convention in Maryland. This was 2019. And I went to a session and I was in the same session. I went to a session about author marketing collectives because marketing is really hard. If you're an author, Nobody realizes what well, authors do, but when you're writing a book, you don't realize how much marketing is going to fall to you. I know I was guilty of that too. You publish it, the publisher takes care of it, you move on to your next book, but it's not like that. And while writing a book is designed to be an individual endeavor, marketing is not. You have to reach out there and it is hard. So at this conference, the session talked about how working together could extend your reach, which is exactly what I needed to do. So I went home to California, went to the next Northern California meeting where Edie happened to be attending and said, we have to do this. And so I wanted to make sure that people who were interested were like, not going, well, okay, that sounds like fun, but we're interested in committing. So I said, come to my house on this date and we'll plan it. This is devious because my house is like the southernest southern end of the region served by the Historical Novel Society of Northern California. I'm like the South Pip. Everybody else, I mean, Edie had to come two hours Edie, from your house. Three. Tonight. Three hours. Three hours. So I figured people are coming yeah. to my house. So there are people who are already thinking seriously about it. And that, as they say, was history. Okay, that's great. And that, as they say, was history. That's great. Anna. Pick up the baton. Tell us a little bit about who you are, what you write, and tell us about what was your impetus for joining the Paper Lanterns Collective and what drew you to it. I'm Anna Brazzle, and I write historical crime fiction because I like to have justice for all. I have a master's degree in history and worked as an architectural historian in Mississippi. So my first novel is set in New Orleans. And unlike Edie and unlike Linda, I had a very, very small publisher. And I guess she was in San Mateo back then. It was a one-person publishing house. And so my book came out a little bit before that HNS conference meeting in Baltimore. I'd already found out how difficult it was for me to market things by myself, for me to promote my book. My publisher had helped me get a very nice award, but it was still on me. So when I went to that HNS meeting that talked about author collectives, I was just there with Linda and I was going, yeah, this is what we need to do. And we met and I did have one goal because I had not sold a lot of books then. And I was still hoping that I could get an agent for my next books because I thought those were so much better and an agent would really want to get those into a publishing house. So one of my goals was really to sell my book so that when an agent said, well, how many of your first novel you sold? Mm -hmm. I could say, oh, a thousand. I would have a good number. So I really did have that specific goal. But in a larger sense, everything we were talking about, creating a collective and doing doing creative things to promote it were things that I really like to do. I was a project manager. I was a team lead of a group of writers at IBM. So I definitely like the structure of people working together towards a common goal. And that just spoke to me as a writer, but it also spoke to my sense of who I was as a person, mm -hmm. which is a project oh. manager and a leader. I saw a role for me. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Great. It's so interesting. You're all in different subsets of historical. I was really struck by that when I first met everybody. Honestly, I was like, how do you make this work? Because your readership 
historical romance might only love that and not love historical crime fiction or those who read the heritage fiction, which I hadn't heard that before, which is beautiful, might not like the others. How do you overcome that hurdle? Who would like to take that one up? I would love to take that one if I could. Yeah, please do. I believe as a reader, I like to read across the spectrum. I love to read science fiction. I love to read fantasy. I love to read biography. I love heritage fiction, crime fiction. I love all of it. I want to read everything. I mean, there are times when I get into one genre more than the other, but then, you know, I'm always drifting off to other other things. And I don't think I'm alone in that. So when we form Paper Lantern, we wondered if historical fiction was going to be a tight enough genre bond for all of us. And we've had to experiment with who on our website. We have areas so we can say, oh, if you are a historical romance person, you know, here are a few offerings that are off. You might, if you are a biographical fiction lover, then try these out. So that way we can cater to everybody, but also just show really, I think a lot of people love historical fiction because you learn something at the same time as getting a story. It's the edutainment. So, and I think that's really what happened. And it's so far been really great. And I do think that our reach has expanded and other people have been able to see. And one thing that I, uh, as the romance writer in the group, for a while I was the only one, I do think that it has really helped because romance uh, as a genre is often seen as being vapid or somehow lesser. And I think that being aligned with just historical fiction has actually helped raise awareness for other readers that, oh, there actually is meat to every one of these books. So let's move into some of the nuts and bolts around what does it mean to actually be a collective? What are some of the rules or guidelines or things that make you a collective? Do you have a working agreement? If you can share with our audience, how does that actually work? Who would like to take that question? I can take that one. We actually have a partnership contract. Now that we're getting bigger, we have 15 members now. So we actually have a partnership agreement that outlines exactly what we do and what our responsibilities are. Basically, informally, when we first started, we basically just formalized our informal agreement, which was we're going to market each other's books. As we went along, we formalized that and we created a calendar so that each week on the calendar, we're responsible for posting about one other member's book. So my particular book will show up at least once a week on somebody else's social media, for example. We speak at conferences. We do a lot of things. Any opportunity that comes along, we look at it and say, if this will be good for the group, we jump in and do it. We try to keep to historical fiction, back to where you're talking about the subgenres, because we find that most people who like historical fiction aren't really into genre. They're just so thrilled to find something that's historical fiction that they just skim over the ones that don't look interesting and gravitate toward the ones that are interesting. But in the meantime, they've seen all our books. That's how it works for all of us. Exposure. Yeah. Monthly meetings Mm -hmm. via Zoom. (laughs) And then we have an executive committee that takes all the ideas of the universe and whittles them down to what we want to talk to at the general meeting so that we keep that doable for everybody else with hours and hours of meetings. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like you have a leadership team and a general membership. And are people paying money to be a part of your group? Is there a financial commitment? Yes, there is. We pay a fee. That fee pretty much pays for our website and the hosting, streaming services and things like that that we have to pay fees for. Great. And you were saying that every week, each person is committing to share another person's book. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. where might that be? A website, a social media channel, newsletter? Our Paper Lantern writers' website and social media, we share often. That's not as strict about sharing individual books. But once a week, we share on our personal social media, we share somebody else's books. I see. That's great. Wonderful. Yeah. Extending the reach, absolutely, and exposure. Extend the reach. It's all about extending the reach. Tell us the URL, the website for Paper Lanterns. How can people find you? Paperlanternwriters.com. That's great. A little challenging to say, (laughs) but totally easy. I'd love to add that we blog three times a week now. So we have new content coming out from each of us, and they are a wide variety of different types of blogs. We have some that are very personal about writing and their writing spaces. We have ones that are very much about history. Today, actually, I posted one about May Day traditions in Regency England, which includes dressing up like a tree, like you do. (laughs) So there is always something coming out and it's going to catch somebody's interest eventually. 
We also try to highlight other writers that are not Paper Lantern writers as well. Once a month, we have a writing interview that we do. I interview traditionally published authors as well on YouTube once a month. So we have a lot of other things that keep Mm us aware of what's going on in publishing and historical fiction. We like Mm -hmm. to know what's going on and we like to share that information. We do have a monthly newsletter also that lets people know what's going on with us, events that are coming up, new releases, things like that. People can join that. They go to a website, they can set up. That's great. That's great. It seems like you have all the media bases covered. You mentioned YouTube. You've got a blog. People have social media, which I'm going to make some assumptions. Or you could tell me what are some of the social media channels that people are using to, to share each other's books? We have Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. We also have a Facebook group called Shine with Paperland and Writers. And the purpose specifically is to connect readers and writers. So we have a lot of very active group of readers that get in there and really love to hear what's going on with us. And then we like to hear what they're reading, what they like to read. Oh, that's wonderful. So I heard Facebook, the Facebook group where you're really connecting with the readers, like it's a readers group. And then you mentioned Twitter and Instagram and then YouTube. I think we're also getting back into yeah. Pinterest a little. That's wonderful. That's great. I'm so glad to hear that you have your own newsletter. And are each of you individually doing newsletters where you reference back to Paper Lantern as well? I do not. <laughs> so I do. I have a monthly newsletter that goes out at the beginning of the month. And I do my best to have not just my own information in there, but I also try to highlight a book that I'm reading that is nothing to do with Paper Lantern writers. But then I do always include like, hey, I'm going to be interviewing so-and-so this month. Or remember last year when I interviewed Lisa C and she was just finishing up a manuscript and she was talking all about her research. And now that book is finally coming out. So I read my last newsletter, I referenced that. And hey, remember when I interviewed Lisa C? Well, now that book's coming out if you want to revisit this and find out all about all of the research she did. So I do reference Paper Lantern writers as well as referencing other writers. And then I also have a portion at the end where I do just talk about some good books I read or TV Mm -hmm. that I'm enjoying. Water cooler things. In the old days (laughs) when there were water coolers. Yeah, yeah. Right. And Linda, you were saying you don't yet. uh... No, I'm I'm in charge of the Paper Lantern Writers Newsletter. (laughs) Oh, that's enough for me. I can't do my own. So on my own website, I have a sign up for Paper Lantern Writers Newsletter. So that they can sign up for that yeah. one. If they want to hear from me, that's where they're going to get it. Good, good. I'm glad you have that organized. And how about you, Anna? Well, I have put my newsletter on hold and actually donate a lot of my email addresses to Paper Lantern Writers so that we could have a very substantial newspaper list. I think right now we mail out to about 2,700 readers. But once I get my trilogy done, I'm going to reactivate my newsletter and start sending it out. And I will certainly talk about Paper Lantern Writers because everybody on that list has been getting the Paper Lantern Writer newsletter for the last year or so. So they know of my devotion to the group. Yeah, that's so great. So great. That's it for part one of this episode with the Paper Lantern Writers. Stay tuned for episode two coming next week, where we go deeper into what this collective does to support each other and market their historical fiction. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening to my podcast. Your interest and feedback is so inspiring to me and helps me know that I'm helping you in some small way. So write long and prosper. Are you stuck and overwhelmed by world building? Then check out my new world building workbook for fiction writers. Head over to howtowritethefuture.com and sign up for yours today.